Buenas tardes. Estamos en la conferencia de Está apagado tu micrófono, Heidi. Ah, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Buenas tardes. Estamos en uh, seminario en honor a Anthony Petre Trua. Y también es una, ese evento es una organización conjunta del campo del conocimiento de desarrollo económico y de la, de la revista Investigación Económica de la UNAM. En esta ocasión tenemos el honor de tener como ponente eh, Esteban Pérez, que nos va a hacer la conferencia. Pero antes de empezar a la conferencia, vamos a tomar algunas palabras de nuestro excelentísimo rector de la Facultad de Economía, Eduardo Vega, que está presente también en este momento, y posteriormente del doctor Lomeli. Eh, no sé si, doctor Vega, perdón, maestro Vega. Con, con mucho gusto, Jaideo. Eh, muy buenas tardes a todas, a todos. La verdad que me da muchísimo gusto compartir este momento con ustedes, porque nuestro posgrado de la Facultad de Economía eh, con este campo de conocimiento en desarrollo económico, rindiéndole honor a las contribuciones conceptuales de nuestra disciplina, al doctor Anthony Thurwald, eh, de quien la revista Investigación Económica, por cierto, en su número 308, publicó por primera vez en español su famosísimo artículo, a partir del cual empezó su contribución profunda y su fama más que merecida entre el mundo de los economistas, de Anthony Thurwell. Eh, yo quisiera referir algunos, eh, algunos señalamientos que me parecen pertinentes. En primer lugar, este seminario organizado eh, por el Campo de Conocimiento de Desarrollo Económico y liderado en esta ocasión eh, por el doctor Ignacio Perrotini, el doctor Benjamín García Páez, entre otros de ustedes, pues la verdad que eh, hace... Eh, mucha contribución también al avance de la Facultad de Economía, pues ni más ni menos que con este seminario genuinamente internacional, con invitados destacados de seis distintos países que en sus respectivas dimensiones siguen trabajando y promoviendo avance y ampliando la frontera del conocimiento de nuestra disciplina, la economía, pues eh, nos traerán en este seminario de marzo a junio, ahí están las fechas en el programa, pues temas muy importantes para seguir repensando nuestra realidad económica, eh, identificando cuáles son los, eh, digamos, hallazgos de la ciencia o del análisis económico eh, desde el rigor científico de los que van a hacer presentaciones en el seminario para continuar la discusión importante, imprescindible, de cómo esas eh, digamos eh, mm, eh, esos avances disciplinarios se traducen también en mejoramiento de la política económica, de la política pública para regular fomentar, promover orientar de mejor manera eh, nuestras expectativas de desarrollo nacional y regional eh, muy destacados economistas hoy día en un momento más Esteban Pérez Caldentey eh, quien desde la CEPAL tiene eh, funciones muy importantes de pues, sistematización, análisis y eh, relanzamiento de los eh, eh, hallazgos que desde la CEPAL se hacen hacia las distintas economías de esta región latinoamericana y del Caribe. Es muy importante que su voz esté presente e inaugurando este seminario. Posteriormente tendremos ni más ni menos que quien le da nombre y honor a este seminario, a Anthony Thurwell, eh, presentando justamente una de sus contribuciones acerca explícitamente del desarrollo económico. Más adelante tendremos, no seguidamente, pero los asocio por nacionalidad, tanto a Ricardo Suma como a Carmen Aparecida, ambos de eh, la Universidad Federal Río de Janeiro, y la verdad que importa mucho escuchar a los colegas brasileiros que eh, pues no hay duda de que al igual que los mexicanos, los chilenos, argentinos, colombianos, peruanos y de otras nacionalidades de esta región, 
pues estamos preocupados en la coyuntura atrapada que nos tiene, eh, no solo la recesión económica y la pandemia, sino también tal vez la falta de ideas eh, pertinentes y sistemáticas a propósito de recuperar el desarrollo como estrategia nacional. Y finalmente, eh, pues eh, Heinz Kurz de la Universidad Graz, Australia, eh, vendrá a recordarnos eh, las contribuciones de Max Berber y, y el espíritu del capitalismo que junto con, ahora sí, para cerrar el seminario hacia finales de junio, eh, nuestros dos eh, profesores igualmente importantes y con un palmarés académico inobjetable como son Fat Bondi e Ignacio Perotini nos eh, compartirán eh, seguramente un adelanto, una actualización de lo que ya presentaron en otro seminario internacional realizado en Glasgow, si entiendo bien, allá por eh, finales de 2019. Entonces, de verdad que el menú académico que nos ofrece este seminario es inmejorable. Les felicito mucho por organizar este tipo de encuentros. Creo que esto debiera ser la norma académica colegiada de todos nuestros campos de conocimiento en el posgrado de la facultad. Y una palabra más para no quitarles más tiempo, eh, ligar este esfuerzo con el de los 80 años de nuestra revista Investigación Económica. Hace ni más ni menos, eh, en el segundo, justamente en el segundo trimestre de 1941, eh, don Jesús Silva Herzog y muchos otros economistas mexicanos, eh, y otros no mexicanos, pero residentes en México, impulsaron este proyecto editorial que pues hoy cumple en, estos, en este segundo trimestre cumplirá 80 años y la verdad que eh, mirando hace un momentito, hace minutos apenas, otra vez el, el contenido del primer número de esa revista, publicada en 1941 por primera vez, eh, nos damos cuenta de la pertinencia y de la herencia profunda que tenemos nosotros en esa revista para seguir impulsando el desarrollo económico. En ese primer número había temas tan importantes como una, un análisis entre 28 naciones acerca de la concentración del desarrollo agropecuario, pero también había compromiso, eh, digamos, eh, eh, contribuciones de la economía de guerra. En ese momento de la Segunda Guerra, justamente, en 1941, había un economista, Goldsmith, que escribió sobre la economía de guerra y la importancia que era discutir los temas eh, convencionales del análisis económico y la política económica, pero en un escenario bélico a escala global. Eh, y había también eh, otros interesantísimos, eh, digamos, artículos más de carácter teórico eh, sobre el desarrollo económico. Entonces, me parece que investigación económica eh, que de manera periódica, puntual, trimestral, sin eh, detenerse, ha venido cumpliendo su papel y eh, hoy día, bajo la dirección del doctor Perrotini, ya desde hace bastante tiempo atrás, para fortuna de todos, pues una vez más cumple estos 80 años de manera inmejorable. Así es que felicidades por los dos, los dos motivos académicos muy valiosos. El seminario internacional que hoy arranca bajo el nombre de Anthony Zerwal y sus contribuciones, y también vinculado con los 80 años de nuestra revista Investigación Económica. Así es que doblemente, eh, pues muchísimo reconocimiento y felicitaciones. Eh, y que nos vaya muy bien en este seminario. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Gracias. Muchas gracias. Do eh, doctor Romeli, nos gustaría dar algunas palabras. Muchas gracias, muy buenas tardes. Eh, bueno, simplemente eh, sumarme a las felicitaciones que ya hacía el director de nuestra facultad, el maestro Eduardo Vega, a la organización del seminario por parte del campo de desarrollo económico del posgrado en economía, pero también eh, que empatan con la celebración de los 80 años de la revista Investigación Económica, sin lugar a dudas, la publicación más emblemática de nuestra facultad es, eh, a todas luces, una de las publicaciones también más influyentes eh, de habla española en economía, aunque bueno, ya otros eh, algunos de sus artículos pueden ser consultados en otras, en otras lenguas, pero 
A partir de 1940, eh, buena parte de la discusión que se da sobre el desarrollo latinoamericano se vio reflejada en estas páginas. Varios de los protagonistas más importantes de eh, las controversias sobre el desarrollo económico latinoamericano escribieron en investigación económica. Economistas muy destacados de nuestro país eh, dirigieron a lo largo de estos 80 años esta revista. Entonces creo que es muy pertinente que como parte de la celebración de los 80 años de investigación económica eh, se, se, se lleve a cabo este seminario del campo de conocimiento como también lo es que esté dedicado al profesor Anthony Tirwell. Me parece muy eh, importante que celebremos las contribuciones del profesor Tirwell que siempre ha estado muy cerca de la Facultad de Economía y además, eh, bueno, pues eh, que se haya logrado reunir a tan destacados exponentes de nuestra disciplina en este seminario. Creo que es un inicio muy eh, importante, de mucha calidad, de estas celebraciones que también nos deben de permitir reflexionar el papel que a lo largo de 80 años ha jugado la entonces Escuela Nacional de Economía, hoy Facultad de Economía, en el pensamiento económico eh, de nuestro país y de América Latina, y cómo esta iniciativa, que en el origen fue del maestro Jesús Silva Gerso, de fundar investigación económica, se logró mantener en el tiempo y se ha podido a lo largo de las distintas décadas por las cuales se ha publicado de manera ininterrumpida la revista, eh, acrecentar, incursionar en varias áreas de la economía, pero nunca sin perder esta... Eh, preocupación central por el desarrollo, que es una característica, sin lugar a dudas, fundacional de la carrera de economía en 1929, de la Escuela Nacional de Economía en 1935 y de la Facultad de Economía que adquirió ese rango a partir de 1976, precisamente cuando se aprueba la creación del doctorado en economía en la entonces eh, todavía Escuela Nacional de Economía. Así que es un periodo de tiempo largo en el cual hay contribuciones muy destacadas, como ya lo decía el maestro Eduardo Vega, y no me resta sino felicitar al actual director de la revista y coordinador de nuestro posgrado en Economía, el doctor Ignacio Perrotini, por esta iniciativa tan afortunada de empatar el homenaje al doctor Sirwal, la eh, efeméride de los 80 primeros años de investigación económica, y el Seminario del Campo de Conocimiento de Desarrollo Económico. Así que, muchas felicitaciones y mis mejores deseos para el éxito del seminario. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Eh, estamos aquí como muy agradecidos por la asistencia. Estamos teniendo bastante asistencia comparado con otras reuniones. Y ese evento es una organización gracias al doctor Benjamín García Páez, que es el coordinador del campo de conocimiento y desarrollo económico. Doctor Benjamín García, algunas palabras para los compañeros. Pues eh, simplemente eh, agradecer mucho la presencia de tan eh, numerosos eh, asistentes virtuales a este seminario en honor de un eh, legendario eh, macroeconomista eh, del desarrollo que eh, ha legado eh, pensamiento eh, que ha sido inspiracional para muchos economistas eh, latinoamericanos y que eh, libros, eh, en este caso como el de desarrollo económico, eh, circulan aún en los lugares más recónditos eh, del planeta. Eh, tengo amigos, afortunadamente, en la Universidad eh, de Pekín y, y ellos este, eh, tienen como un parámetro de referencia muy importante ese, ese libro. Eh, por supuesto, sin dejar de apreciar eh, la productividad que en términos de papers en términos también de otros libros eh, autoriados, coautoriados. Así que 
Pues en, en realidad eh, es un momento eh, muy emotivo eh, el que estamos viviendo porque eh, ahora pues eh, se, se combina eh, con el aniversario número 80 de la revista de investigación económica, la cual eh, fue este, perfectamente contextualizada por el doctor doctor Lomelí Vanegas, eh, así que esperemos que eh, todas las sesiones eh, programadas para este primer semestre sean del interés eh, intelectual, eh, pero sobre todo sean eh, instrumentales para las investigaciones eh, económicas eh, que en materia de economía del crecimiento, economía del desarrollo, están llevando no solo eh, nuestros alumnos. Eh, finalmente, quisiera decir que los alcances de, esta, de este evento pues son en realidad eh, mundiales. Eh, el Centro eh, para Estudios del Desarrollo Económico de Cambridge University se ha encargado también de divulgarla en eh, en su, que en su lista, en su mailing list que tiene pues, prácticamente de todos los, de todos los, de todos los continentes eh, en, de, de, del, del planeta. Así que eh, seguramente también degustarán eh, las temáticas que tenemos eh, programadas, pero sobre todo eh, estarán eh, de acuerdo con nosotros en haber eh, titulado a este seminario, haber dedicado este seminario al profesor Anthony P. Thirwell. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, doctor Benjamín. Eh, doctor Ignacio, algunas palabras con relación al evento en conmemoración 80 años de la revista y desarrollo económico. Bueno, creo que lo importante ya se ha dicho. Eh, seré breve porque creo que ya todos queremos escuchar a, a Esteban. ¿no? Entonces, y si me permiten y me perdonan, quiero referirme al profesor Anthony Fairward y lo haré eh, en inglés y damos paso ya a la presentación de, de Esteban, ¿no? Este, eh, well, um, I, I just want to, I, I, the, the important things have already been said. And I just wanted to, to, to mention a couple of things. To begin with, uh, I'm really grateful uh, to my colleagues, uh, Dr. Leonardo Romelli and uh, Eduardo Vega for uh, the continued support that I have received uh, over the years uh, while I've been uh, the chief editor of the journal. Without their support, it would have been impossible to achieve the, 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 uh, the success that we have had over the years. And I think this is very important. I mean, it, it's a good uh, moment to, to acknowledge uh, their support. And secondly, uh, secondly, I would like to, oops, uh, something happened, algo pasó que no puedo mirar. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, uh, and, and secondly, uh, I would like to take this opportunity to, to thank uh, 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 Professor Anthony Thurwell for having accepted to, uh, 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 to, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, to name this seminar after his, his uh, very important name and contribution to the field of uh, development economics. So I, I think it was about time to, to recognize in our school the, the, the important contribution of, of Tony because uh, his work is widely read in, in, in our university, in our school, and not only by uh, uh, faculty members, but also by students. And uh, I, I would say that uh, uh, several uh, uh, papers and uh, uh, books uh, that he has produced have been translated into Spanish. So, so they are available uh, in our language uh, for the benefit of our students. So Tony, many thanks, many thanks for, for your contributions and many thanks for having accepted to support us in this endeavor. Thank you.
adelante. Eh, ok, sí, eh, entonces vamos a empezar con el evento, con la presentación de Esteban Pérez. Antes de eso, les menciono que ustedes ya lo conocen, pero Esteban Pérez eh, Caldente es oficial superior de Asuntos Económicos y jefe de la Unidad de Financiamiento de la CEPAL. Tiene una maestría y doctorado en Economía por el New School for Social Research, es coeditor del Review of Keynesian Economics y coeditor en jefe del Paul Grave Dictionary of Economics. Es miembro del Comité Editorial de la revista Investigación Económica y del Comité de Asesores de International Economic Development Associates. Es autor de la primera bibliografía intelectual sobre Roy Har Harold. Eh, Esteban, eh, es todo tuyo. Bueno, muchas gracias por estar con nosotros. No te escuchamos, Esteban. Abre tu Sorry. micrófono. Now you can, now you can hear me, right? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, I'm going to speak in English and I'm going to uh, share my uh, my screen. Hold on for a sec, please. You can see the screen, right? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Ignacio Perrotini, uh, the, the Autonomous University of Mexico, for this invitation. It's really an honor to uh, be the first one to make a presentation in the seminar in honor of uh, Tony Thurwell. Uh, and I have to just uh, thank uh, Tony Thurwell for uh, uh, the, I, actually, the work he's done has been very influential on the way I look on, on economics and developing economics. And thank him also for all his uh, patience and encouragement uh, that allowed me to finish uh, the book on, on Roy Harrod that's been published in 2019, thanks to, thanks to uh, Tony. Um, I'm uh, the subject of uh, my presentation is the external financial restriction. And the idea of this presentation, which is in a way work in progress, is to try to focus not so much on the current account, but to focus on the other side of the balance of payments account and the financial account and how uh, the financial account and the variables and dynamics in the, on the side of the financial account can set an important restriction to countries that have uh, that try to fulfill that try to uh, uh, imp uh, that try to pursue policies of full employment. Uh, the uh, my presentation will be based on these four ideas. The first one is one of currency hierarchy and the role of the uh, of developed countries reserve currencies, and in particular the dollar. I think that plays an important part in uh, the balance of payments constraint, at least for developed economies, in the sense that developed economies have to export to earn uh, the, uh, the, 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 the foreign exchange to pay for imports. And I think it has a lot to do with uh, 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 Tony Thurwell's balance of payments constraint. Uh, I know it's not uh, balance of payments constraint, it has purely applies to developing economies. It's for uh, first article 1979 focus on developed economies. But I think that in the case of develop, developing economies, uh, the uh, balance of payments constraint is bites even harder because of currency hierarchy. Uh, the second is uh, the issue of financial integration and how uh, developing economies have integrated themselves financially into international uh, uh, capital and bank loan markets and why uh, uh, financial flows, including portfolio flows and um, uh, foreign direct investment really are part of long-term trends that we see in balance of payments. Uh, the third uh, issue that I'm going to be talking is on dependence of short-term flows and how developing economies and in particular 
uh, Latin American economies have become very dependent on short-term flows. And that refers not only to portfolio flows, but also to foreign direct investment flows. When you separate uh, foreign direct investment flows into equity flows and intercompany loans, because intercompany loans tend to behave like short-term flows. And if you put together intercompany loans with portfolio and other investment, you will see that short-term flows have tended to increase over time. These uh, Latin American economies, as I said before, have become more uh, uh, dependent on these types of flows. And not necessarily to finance in, a, in, a, in an accounting sense, uh, the, uh, the, the current account. I think there is sometimes uh, a separation. I think there is an independence between, in, in an economic sense, between the current account and the financial account of the balance of payments. The last issue I'm going to be talking is about arbitrage, hedging, and currency mismatch. I think that currency hierarchy, which means uh, uh, that the dollar, for example, has really a, a predominant uh, role in terms of financial and, and, and trade transactions. Uh, and that is very different whether the promises uh, in payment are made, let's say in dollars or in Chilean pesos or in Peruvian sol solis, means that arbitrage is very difficult to, to uh, undertake. I mean, to, to have arbitrage in these economies and it's very difficult to hedge uh, 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 financial and, uh, and foreign exchange uh, positions. And I'm going to show you some data on this. And uh, as a result, what you have in some sectors is inevitably currency mismatch, which is exposes these economies to uh, vulnerabilities and to uh, changes, for example, that the nominal exchange rate can have on balance sheets. So I'm going to start uh, uh, talking a little bit about uh, uh, Latin America and the Caribbean and I'll show you this graph that shows the annual GDP uh, growth rate. It's a seven year average and uh, it, uh, that spans from 1951 to 2017 or 2018, just before, actually it goes to 2019 here, just before the pandemic. And you will see that be, be between 1951, 1980, uh, the rate of growth averaged about you know, six or five point something percent. And that there was a real decline in the, in the growth trend in the average uh, uh, between the period ranging from 1951 to 19, about 1980. And then from 1981 to uh, uh, 19 of 2014 and then to 2016 and 17 and 2018 and 19. And uh, although certainly this period refers to the golden age of growth of capitalism, it is true that the period ranging from the 1980s to the 2000 something also is a period of uh, financial crisis. If you see the 1980s uh, uh, debt crisis as a financial crisis, the Argentine crisis, the Asian crisis here in 1993, 1990, and 99, and then uh, the uh, global financial crisis, which produced a, a, a contraction in regional GDP growth, uh, which is the only other contraction except for 2018 besides the 1980s. And this uh, uh, graph of, uh, of uh, Latin America, which shows a decline in the, in the trend of GDP in the average over time, uh, made me think uh, that not only was the balance of payments on the current account an important obstacle constraint to growth, even in medium long-term growth, but also that you had to look at the financial side of the current account, especially as Latin American countries and other developing countries have become really integrated into, into international, international capital markets. And I'm going to go uh, uh, right into the first uh, item that I want to discuss, the first section, which is about currency hierarchy, which we know that uh, there's a big disparity between what, for example, the U.S. represents in terms of world trade 
and uh, in terms of GDP and in terms of what the US dollar represents uh, in terms of financial transactions and trade transactions. We know that worldwide around 80% of international transactions are conducted in dollars. And everyone knows uh, that the US is probably the only economy whose currency really strengthened after a financial crisis and even during the financial crisis. And this has happened, not only, not only this happened in 2008, it happened also during uh, the, the, uh, the um, under the, uh, the, the COVID uh, crisis. We know that half of the international trade is invoiced in dollars. Uh, we know that dollar denominated debt accounts for uh, 80 percent of total issuance in emerging markets and developing economies and here you have the breakdown by uh, by by um, by region uh, the and then the uh, uh, the second uh, issue the second theme I wanted to uh, to address is the um, the relation between the higher currency hierarchy and the balance of payments constraint. And here, I just want to, uh, to just to give two quotations from uh, uh, from AP Thurwa from 2002 and from uh, Macomb and Thurwa from 1999. The one from 2002 explains why export different from other components of demand because they are the true component of autonomous demand in an economic system. Because it's the only component that emanates from outside the system and it's the only component that can pay for the import requirements for growth. That's certainly not true of consumption and it's certainly not true as investment as I will, as I will show you because investment in developing economies has an important part uh, uh, as an important component of uh, import component, uh, basically due to uh, machinery and, and equipment. Uh, the definition of the balance of payments constraint is that countries face an external constraint when their performance in foreign markets and the response of financial markets to this performance restricts growth to a late to a rate lower than internal conditions require or, will, or would warrant. And here, what I'm going to be uh, focusing is uh, instead of um, uh, trade markets is financial markets. Here is, I'm gonna show you just some graphs that can illustrate this idea that exports are the true, uh, truly autonomous variable, autonomous demand and why countries really are constrained by their balance of payments. This graph, which I think is very illustri illustrative of Latin America shows Argentina. Uh, it's for Argentina and it shows the machinery and equipment. This is investment as a percentage of GDP, with, which is local durable equipment that is produced in Argentina and imported durable equipment, uh, this as a percentage of GDP. And you will see that imported durable equipment is uh, in terms of GDP is much higher than local durable equipment. That is investment has an important component that depends on foreign markets. Uh, the other graph that I wanted to show you uh, is this is why countries face a binding external constraint. These are two graphs. Uh, this is an exercise. America and the Caribbean and Asia, and it shows the years of duration of current account deficits for the period 1980 to 2003. And here, this is an arbitrary threshold the exercise was, was done with different threshold, but the result is basically the same. This is a threshold for 2.5% of uh, in the balance of payments in terms of GDP. And it shows uh, the number of observed cases that were able to keep 
a balance of payments, to maintain a balance of payments of 2.5 in one year, two years, and so on. And you see both for Latin America and for Asia, an obviously a an, uh, uh, decline in the number of years that countries are able to maintain a certain current account deficit, which uh, uh, obviously goes, it's uh, the same, goes in line with uh, this idea that countries are balanced of payments constraint. And that in the case of uh, developing countries, the fact that these countries cannot issue reserve currency, uh, I think makes them much more susceptible to uh, to uh, uh, to have their growth restricted by the balance of payments. Austerity is obviously always the preferred policy options to reduce current account imbalances. This is shown here through two simple. Uh, the first one shows a histogram of the variation in the effective real exchange rate. And you will see that in general, uh, the rate of growth of the real exchange rate and the frequency uh, hovers around zero. That is exchange rate barely uh, uh, vary over time, just as in uh, uh, third world's uh, balance of pay, the balance of payments constrained growth uh, theory. And if you look at exports and imports in uh, volume for a similar data set for similar uh, for a similar period of time, you will see that uh, 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 the the rate of growth tends to be either to the right or to the left of zero, but it doesn't center really around zero, which gives you a sense that income effects are much more important than substitution or real price effects, which uh, validates uh, the, uh, the, uh, the balance of payments constraint without any really econometrics, really uh, simple by, by, by visible inspection of a, of a histogram. Now, the fact that I wanted to, uh, to, to add to this story is what happens to the financial account of the balance of payments. Uh, and the first graph that I wanted to show you, or the first piece of evidence I wanted to show you, is the uh, net flows of foreign direct investment portfolio and other investment for Latin America for 1980 and 2017. And you will see that over time, uh, there has been an increase in FDI. And this includes obviously intercompany loans, and I understand that the balance of payments constraint, as Macomb Minton in Third World uh, explained in their 19, 1994 book, uh, should include the basic balance as a way uh, to measure the, the balance of payment, the balance of payments, uh, that is uh, uh, the, the balance of payments constraint. Uh, and well, you can see that foreign direct investment is an important component in and, and is an important component over the long run. If you take 1980, for example, 2019, uh, we're, we're taking about 40 years. Uh, but portfolio flows are also an important component uh, in Latin America, and they have remained an important component and so uh, uh, have other investment. And although other investment here is negative, if you try to separate between net and gross flow, you will see that gross flows uh, that uh, into Latin America, uh, at least portfolio flows, are a fairly uh, constant component of the balance of payments on the on the financial side. And the idea is to find as to ask. Uh, uh, oneself, what do these uh, trends in terms of financial flows show and what are their implications for Latin America? And what are the implications in terms of growth and in terms also of uh, development? Uh, the first uh, uh, piece of, uh, let's say, companion graph that I wanted to show you uh, that sort of complement these graphs is that 
emerging market economies and Latin American economies, along with these increases in financial flows have registered over time an increase in their levels of indebtedness. And this, uh, I think, is consistent with the role that bond markets have, uh, have taken on in the international economy as uh, 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 the main provider of finance to developing markets, especially as you can see after the 2009 crisis and that uh, the bond markets have not been affected uh, recently, let's say in the pandemic, uh, by COVID-19, by the pandemic, as they were, let's say, in 2009. You can see here that actually during the pandemic, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the rate of growth of uh, the, uh, the, the stock, the outstanding stock of debt securities has increased and did not decline significantly like you see, for example, in the 2009, 2008, 2009 crisis. Uh, the other uh, piece of evidence that I wanted to show you regarding the role that financial flows can play in placing uh, some kind of constraint, uh, constraint on uh, developing countries and Latin American country, uh, uh, growth is uh, intercompany loans uh, and FDI. In general, what uh, you see, what I showed you before in terms of uh, the um, the evolution of the different types of financial flows. Here you see portfolio flows, but part of that portfolio flows actually includes intercompany loans. And intercompany loans actually tend to behave like short-term portfolio flows. Uh, foreign direct investment is defined as uh, by norm as uh, when a, a foreign direct investment has, I think like a 10% uh, share or long-term interest in a company in a developing country. And uh, once that is defined, whatever transaction takes place within that uh, regulation is considered a foreign direct investment, including a, uh, a intercompany loans. Uh, the uh, uh, analysis that I've done in terms of variation cycles and so on points uh, to the fact that intercompany loans tend to behave like short-term portfolio flows. And if one includes short-term portfolio flows as a percent of uh, total flows, uh, short-term flows that include um, intercompany loans, you will see that uh, in 2010, 2017, they represented about 47 47.5% of uh, total flows. Uh, these are the, uh, the importance of short-term flows uh, that, it, that if you take, if you uh, exclude equity, uh, can be sort of uh, ascertained or can be highlighted or uh, underscored if uh, we take into account this relation between the nominal exchange rate variations and sovereign risk perceptions. And uh, the graph that I'm showing you here uh, uh, is the rate of change of emerging market bond index, which is in red, and the, vari and the rate of change of nominal exchange rate, which is in blue, for the period 2000-2020. Uh, you hear for Argentina, this is in levels because Argentina is very difficult to get the correlation in, in rates of change. But for the rest of the countries, uh, you have uh, the uh, rate of uh, change of the nominal exchange rate with the rate of change of the emerging market bond index for Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Mexico, and Peru. And uh, actually you see a fairly significant correlation in all the cases with a, a, a co correlation coefficient that's statistically significant, 0 0.71 for Brazil, 46 for Chile, 64 for Colombia, 63 for Mexico and Peru, 0 0.39. And one may wonder about the causality between both. And in fact, uh, the causality when um, we 
you know, we do the general uh, type of procedures. And this was done by uh, uh, Lorenzo Nalin for 2000, uh, for recently, 2021, for these five countries. What you see in general is a causation that grow, goes from nominal exchange rate to the um, to uh, per, uh, risk percep sovereign risk perceptions to the emerging market bot index. That is, any change in nominal exchange rates causes uh, a higher risk in uh, in developing countries. This is for Chile, Colombia, Mexico, and and Peru. For example, one can think that a uh, expansionary monetary policy that decides to decrease the rate of interest and as a result uh, uh, translates into a depreciation of the nominal exchange rate causes risk to increase. This can cause a capital outflow and uh, this can cause actually the authorities to increase uh, the monetary rate of interest to avoid a capital outflow out of the country. This is one of the mechanisms through which uh, this financial uh, restriction works. And in fact, if you one thinks about such a, such a transmission mechanism, uh, it, it's fa in fact, it does not depend on whether, uh, let's say, the nominal exchange rate causes a depreciation in, uh, uh, causes a depreciation and an and increase in debt in the agents that hold uh, uh, foreign currency debt. It may also impinge on foreign investors that are holding domestic debt. So the issue is not all, always in which uh, currency the debt is denominated, but, uh, it, uh, it, uh, but rather, uh, it, the, the issue uh, re revolves around who owns the debt. Uh, this is uh, the only uh, evidence that I could find so far regarding foreign and domestic ownership. And you can see that in some cases, the foreign ownership in the case of Colombia, for example, Argentina, Mexico, and Peru is fairly high. And if uh, foreign investors that invest in domestic markets in local currency have a perception, an expectation, let's say, that there will be uh, exchange rate depreciation and they will have a capital loss uh, in the same way, you know, that liquidity preference works with uh, the inverse relation between rates of interest and the price of bonds they may decide to take out their uh, their money out of the country and uh, this can lead to an increase uh, increasing risk uh, the increasing risk obviously leads uh, to a higher indebtedness cost and um, at the same time when they decide to take their money out of the country that leads to a, a capital outflow and the capital outflow and the depreciation of the exchange rate may uh, induce um, uh, the authorities to raise the interest rate, uh, then putting an end, let's say, to the expansionary effect of the decline in, in, uh, in interest rates. Uh, the, in, in, the, in, the, in the case of the pandemic right now where we're uh, in, in let's say what's happening today, uh, the capital uh, flows which have been uh, uh, going into emerging market economies might well stop and we may see a reversal in, um, in capital uh, flows. Uh, this is a, uh, a graph that shows the evolution of the rate of return of government debt and local uh, currency government uh, debt index for uh, December 2020 until March 2021. And you see a decline in the rate of return from uh, uh, about February 2021. And, uh, and obviously, this also has implications in terms of 
growth for developing economies. Now, uh, this is an aside that I just wanted to see, to tell you what's happening today in uh, current markets. Uh, the last issue I wanted to uh, to focus on, besides uh, the uh, the dependent financial integration and dependency on short term flows, is the issue of arbitrage, hedge, hedging, and currency mismatch, and why let's say a uh, depreciation of the exchange rate can cause a um, a, can put an end, let's say, to growth besides uh, the, uh, the mechanisms that I just mentioned in terms of higher uh, debt cost and uh, capital outflows. And this is uh, the idea of, uh, of currency hierarchy. Currency hierarchy means, uh, from my point of view, uh, that uh, the uh, assets denominated in different currencies are imperfect substitutes. That is, it's not the same thing to have an asset denominated in US dollars as uh, an asset denominated in Chilean pesos or Peruvian soles. And this is independently of full capital mobility. One can have full capital mobility as, and at the same time, currency hierarchy. And the issue of currency hierarchy that some currencies have a greater value than some other currencies, let's say this idea uh, that one can think of, of liquidity, uh, more, more certain currencies have more, have uh, greater liquidity than other currencies means that uh, currencies are imperfect substitutes and very imperfect substitutes. And when one thinks that currency uh, are imperfect substitutes, then it is very difficult to, uh, to carry out arbitrage operations or even hedging. And uh, this uh, is somehow um, underscored by the fact uh, that some agents in developing economies, especially the non-finance, the non-government corporate sector, and I'm thinking about the non-financial corporate sector, tends to operate with currency mismatches. And this table shows just that. It shows the net foreign currency assets of the non-government corporate sector as a percentage of exports or selected emerging market economies from 2007 till 2014. The, 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 the table not only shows uh, currency mismatches, but shows that currency mismatches have tended to increase over time for different developing economies, whether it's Brazil, Chile, Mexico, or uh, Asian countries, or whether it's emerging uh, market, uh, emerging Europe, such as Poland or the Middle East, such as Turkey. And, and this means basically that uh, the non-government corporate sector is highly exposed to changes in the exchange rate. And if one takes into account what is happening today that I showed you before, that uh, the emerging market economies have tended to increase their indebtedness in uh, in, uh, in international capital markets, in foreign currency, where they are exposed to a greater currency mismatch with an increasing level of indebtedness. And this cre creates uh, uh, vulnerabilities and this creates financial fragilities in the sense of uh, Minsky or other, uh, uh, let's say, post keynesian financial uh, uh, points of view. And uh, that means that in general, when um, companies have a certain amount of leverage or they're in a situation where let's say where the growth has decreased or the trend growth has declined as in the case of Latin America, they have higher levels of debt and at the, and at the same time, they have higher exposure to uh, debts, uh, uh, then they, do not use, let's say, the proceeds from their debt 
in order to increase investment. Uh, they can use their proceeds, for example, to increase their liquidity, to increase their buffer stocks. And uh, in and what happens in general is that under these circumstances, companies don't invest. If one takes into account that the companies that uh, issue debt into the international in the international uh, capital markets are the bigger companies and the ones that really account for the bulk or the largest share of investment, then one can see the increase in capital flows with the increase in debt. Uh, with the rising um, um, currency mismatches uh, and the lower growth accompanied by lower investment. So these types of, of mechanisms are mechanisms that can be, uh, and let's say, can be okay, uh, financial mechanisms uh, of the financial side, the financial account, other balance of payments uh, that uh, can, from my point of view, uh, 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 or, uh, 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 create important, let's say, obstacles uh, of economies to try to carry out countercyclical policies, expansionary policies, and full employment policies. And even in some circumstances, and this is only obviously an intuition, the financial restrictions to growth may buy before uh, the, the, the current account uh, restrictions to growth do. And if one thinks that, the, that there is a relation, a long-term relation between finance and the real economy, well, these financial sectors may not only be important in the short run, but certainly be also relevant to the medium and long run. That's what I wanted to say. to say thank you very much. Thank you, Esteban. Muchas gracias, Esteban. Eh, vamos a la sesión de preguntas y participaciones de los asistentes. Eh, las personas que les guste hacer preguntas puede hacer en idioma español o inglés para, con relación a ese tema. Voluntarios, pueden levantar la mano. Hello. 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 Hello, Tony. I'm, I'm, Please, I'm, I'm, you can I'm answer. Tony. Yes. I'm, I'm Tony Thirlwall. I'm, I'm sitting in a room in uh, Canterbury, in Kent, in England. And I just wanted to say that, you know, it's an honor for me to have my name associated with this seminar program. And uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to participating in the program sometime in uh, April. And thank you also for the kind words that the people who introduced the, the seminar said about me. Uh, I don't feel very special at all, but humble an economist. And I'd also like to uh, plug or to advertise um, Esteban's book on uh, Roy Harrod, mentioned that it was published in 2019 in The Great Thinkers in Economics. Uh, it's an excellent book, a very good read. And I regard Harrod as the second most original British economist of the 20th century, after Keynes. So it's worth reading from that point of view, because, you know, we associate him with growth theory, but he also made very important contributions in the 30s to the theory of the firm, in the 20s, 30s to the theory of the firm, to international trade, to the balance of payments theory. He wrote the biography of Keynes, and also he, also, he regarded in his most famous work, a book on inductive logic, which uh, I've never managed to fully uh, comprehend, but uh, there we are. But now turning to Esteban's paper, I, I only had a chance to look at it very quickly, but the first thing I underlined was on page one, and he ended his talk with this sentence that the financial external constraint may bite before the external constraint reflected 
in the current account. Now, I, I pricked up my ears then because it seems to me the sorts of things that uh, Esteban is talking about, particularly early on when he was talking about uh, the sections about currency devaluation, interest rates rising, this sort of thing, are the consequence of the current account being in deficit. You wouldn't expect that's the same sort of behavior if the current account was in surplus. So I'd be interested to hear what he has to say about that particular topic. The second point I would like to make is that if you do extend the basic balance of payments model, where the strange of the current account to capital flows, and even if you assume that the current account is as much as 10% of GDP, when you do some simulations or some hypothetical uh, examples, say, you know, from the simple model, if the export growth is 10% and the income elasticity imports is 2, you get a prediction of 5%. You extend the model to capital flows, assume that they finance. 10% of imports, and the predicted growth rate changes by only about 0.3 percentage points. It makes a difference if you extend it to debt creating flows, where you have the interest rate payments, but still it's the export growth that dominates rather than the role of capital. Thank you. Um, Stephen, any comments? Your mic, Stephen, we can't hear you. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Tony, for, for your comments and for the advertisement of the uh, Arab book. I just wanted to say one thing. Uh, regarding the, the, the exchange rate, I completely agree. You can have the channel that goes through the current account. But you can have a depreciation of the exchange rate without having a significant, let's say, current account deficit. And that can work through the financial side of the current account. For example, when there are greater, greater risk perceptions, and we saw that, for example, in certain uh, crisis periods, when developing countries really need, for example, financial flows, in order to finance, for example, certain transactions or expansion in, in fiscal deficits uh, during the pandemic, at, the, at least, for example, at the beginning, we saw capital outflows and depreciations of the exchange rate. Uh, and this was not necessarily related to the current account. So uh, there, there's certainly, uh, uh, if, you, if there's a current account deficit and there's a depreciation of the exchange rate, these mechanisms are at work but you do not require a current account deficit for the exchange rate to depreciate. It may be due sometimes to other factors, let's say other types of financial factors. And uh, that certainly uh, can go in, uh, can, is, is not, uh, uh, let's say, does not go against the balance of payments constraint. It reinforces the balance of payments constraint. But from my point of view, in a financially integrated world, uh, sometimes financial uh, factors can really uh, be an important stumbling block to long-term growth. And that's what I was trying to say. Regarding uh, the, uh, the, the capital flows, I completely agree. I mean, uh, you say in your book that the, the true measure of the, uh, of the balance of payments constraint is a basic balance, if I recall correctly. And, and I certainly agree. I wouldn't say that, uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, short-term capital flows increases growth. Uh, if you take, uh, if you look at the, the graph I showed, there was uh, the first uh, uh, graph I showed was a decline in the rate of growth. And the third or fourth or fifth graph was an increase in short-term flows. So that says exactly uh, what you're trying to say. What I'm, I'm trying to say uh, was that the dependence on, on uh, for whatever reasons on, on, uh, on short-term capital flows uh, sets an important constraint to uh, uh, the expansion of domestic demand 
for uh, the reasons that I mentioned before. For example, you can have an expansion in government deficit. The government deficit may not translate into an increase in imports or to a significant increase in imports because let's say the government has uh, decreased its uh, let's say uh, in terms of in public investment public investment in latin america is very low due to the washington consensus policies but it, it may cause before it, it, it let's say you increase it to a certain uh, level that impinges on the current account it may cause an increase in risk perceptions in uh, in an increase in the emerging market but index saying that uh, your the sovereign uh, sovereign uh, risk has increased sovereign risk increases if you take into account the relation i showed between the nominal exchange rate this produces uh, capital outflows capital outflows produce a decline in the uh, a, 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 a currency exchange depreciation from the financial side Exchange currency depreciation obviously increases the cost of debt uh, to the uh, on the government side, as well as the increase in the in the in the risk perceptions. And if one takes into account the fact that the non-government uh, corporate sector has currency mismatches, it creates at the same time a balance sheet problem in terms of the uh, non-financial. Uh, uh, non non government corporate sector, so you may end up through these mechanisms with perhaps increasing debt because your costs of debt increase, and at the same time with lower investment and lower growth. And those are the types of mechanisms that I'm trying to show. But certainly, I agree, and you show that very well in your article, my combi nineteen, uh, I think nineteen ninety ninety nine or ninety eight, that increasing debt does not lead to higher growth and as i uh, um, as i mentioned explicitly in my presentation that growth that exports is the truly autonomous component of of aggregate demand and the graph that i show for argentina is just illustrate uh, an illustration but you find the same thing for other other uh, other uh, countries in latin america now this is an aside the fact, for example, that import, uh, that investment has a very high import component means sometimes, and this is, I, I have found this in empirical work, that an appreciation of the exchange rate because it reduces the cost of importing, uh, uh, the cost of, uh, of the imports uh, related to investment uh, can lead to increased investment and uh, depreciation or more competitive exchange rate leads to the opposite result. So you get uh, uh, very odd results uh, uh, because of these uh, these uh, characteristics of developing economies. Yeah. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you, Esteban. Uh, Francisco Martin, when you ask a, a question. Uh, yes. Can I do that? Can I do that now? Yes, please. Thank you, Esteban, for your presentation. It was a, a great uh, representation and nice to see you. Uh, before I make my questions, I also want to advertise my my book review that I made with Victor about your book, uh, Harold book, published in El Roque. So, uh, well, um, three quick questions. The first one is, you imply that when there is a uh, uh, monetary expansion there could be a reduction in the interest rate, and then that can, sorry, there is a, a monetary expansion that can lead to uh, depreciation, and then the interest rates uh, start being higher. The central bank had to increase the interest rate to prevent the effects of devaluation. So you, you are implying that this mechanism doesn't work, or is not enough the, the increase in the interest rate when there is a depreciation. The other, the other question is, about the the percentage of change of the exchange rate. When you refer to depreciation, uh, well, it, th th there could be different degrees, no, different okay, percentages. More or less, uh, to to have to have an, a big impact, which could be the the, the I mean, probably 10, 50 percent. I don't know uh, which is the uh, the main impact on depreciation. And the last one, uh, very quickly, is 
you know that some senior economists in Latin America are uh, saying that depreciation of the exchange rate can improve enhance uh, export, exports. So what, what they are seeing that we don't know, or what, why don't we are not seeing? So why they are uh, uh, saying that depreciation can start or uh, it's, a, it's a dynamic factor for economic growth. Why, why they are saying that and we, you are showing the opposite. So that is my three questions. Thank you. Thank you, Esteban. Question. The, the depreciation of the exchange rate and the real exchange rate in the long run and this, I completely agree with uh, uh, Tony Thurwell's position in balance payments constraint and empirical work. The real exchange rate over the long run does not vary very much. And uh, uh, in, what, what drives the current account are income effects, not relative price effects. And that I, I think I showed you, I showed that in a, in, in a histogram, in a very simple histogram. Regarding the, the short term effect of a depreciation in the exchange and nominal exchange rate and real exchange rate is uh, my answer is the following and this is in a bis report also that came in 2019 and what they say and i i tend to agree also with this that is in the short run uh imports a trade is invoiced in foreign currency and so depreciation of uh, the uh, depreciation of the exchange rate may just uh, 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 result in increased cost and increased prices and not necessarily in terms of competitiveness. And if in addition, you take into account this idea that I just said, and uh, I, I saw, I, we did uh, some, um, uh, some studies for Argentina, Colombia, and some other countries that showed that investment has, the rate of growth of investment has uh, an, a negative effect, a negative relation with the real exchange rate. So when you have a depreciation of the real exchange rate because uh, a nominal exchange rate that results in a depreciation of the real exchange rate, the, uh, uh, the cost of importing investment increase, and so you, in, you import less, uh, uh, let's say, uh, the, the, comp the important component of investment decreases since the important component represents at least half or more of total investment. Other things being equal, you will have a decline in investment. And that's, but uh, I think economists in general, they take into account the relative, uh, the relative price effects uh, I think the balance of payments constraint focuses on income effects as, you know, as all Keynesians do and not relative price uh, effects. Regarding the, the, the idea of the, uh, uh, of the expansionary policies, you can have, let's say you try to increase your rate of growth. You try to pursue, let's say, you, uh, you adopt a counter-cyclical policy or uh, let's say a, a full employment policy. And uh, your, your fiscal, uh, your, the gover government revenues increases, increases. Uh, uh, what your, your micro is not working. The, uh, can you see it here now? Okay. The, the impact of the the uh, the deficit uh, is an increase uh, 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 downgrade let's say in your credit uh, rating for example downgrade in your credit rating means an increase in uh, the emerging market bond index an increase in the emerging market bond index uh, is associated with a depreciation of the exchange rate and you have all these effects in the economy. Depreciation of the exchange rate may cause inflation, does not cause exports for the reason, the short term, because exports are invoiced in domestic currency. Depreciation of the nominal exchange rate can aggravate the currency mismatches of the non-financial corporate sector. That leads to less investment. 
uh, at the same time, uh, the increase, let's say, in the emerging market bond index leads to increased costs, uh, greater risk perceptions, less capital flows, and so on. And so you can have a, a, a line of causality, and it's not the capital flows that are, are uh, causing growth. It, it is the fact uh, that when a currency depreciates and you have a uh, a, um, a non-financial corporate sector that has a high, a big, let's say wide currency mismatch, they may decide not to invest anymore. And that, that can, can impact on, the, on, uh, on, uh, on investment. The, the exercises of the study and the analysis, I'm again, the analysis the studies have done were uh, uh, show that in general, the uh, the non-financial corporate sector, let's say, that invest in uh, uh, the uh, bonds in international bonds, uh, has a, a, a leverage of about 0.6 or 0.7, and beyond a certain levels of indebtedness, they just do not invest. So that, uh, for example, the relation between debt and investment in, is non-linear. You can you can increase your debt and you can e and increase your investment and beyond a certain threshold you have the opposite relation you can increase your debt and you decrease your investment so that i think is one mechanism and this has also been uh, uh, shown in the case of europe you, that's one mechanism that uh, pulls growth down uh, and the same thing can happen through, let's say, expansionary monetary policies where you have a decline in the rate of interest and you have a depreciation in the exchange rate. You have, again, uh, this idea of uh, increasing risk and, uh, uh, and you can have and, uh, and if you have capital outflows, uh, then uh, the, uh, the authorities may decide to increase the rate of interest and because of currency sub, uh, imperfect currency substitution, actually the increase the rate of interest may have to be much higher than the declines in the, in the rate of interest. And that really can affect uh, growth. It can affect uh, aggregate demand. And I think through aggregate demand, uh, medium and long-term growth. That's the way I see those mechanisms. And those mechanisms are on the, on the financial side and they can complement but they can also occur without the effects of the expansion of monetary policy and fiscal policy on the current account. Yeah, but by the way, um, uh, with regard to the causality test, I didn't get that part. Uh, which, which variable causes which one? Uh, the uh, MPE well, causes uh, the rate or the other way around? Well, we had the, basically it was, I think it was the exchange rate that caused the, the MB. We found by very causality, but the causality was stronger from exchange rate to. Uh, if you think, for example, in terms of foreign investors, uh, there was for some time during the Washington consensus this idea that uh, developing countries needed to expand their local bond markets and that the expansion of their local bond markets would, uh, let's say, uh, prevent them for ha from having currency crisis or foreign denominated debt. But uh, my point of view, and this is what I tried to, to show in the presentation, it, it's not a, only an issue of whether uh, the, your debt is denominated in a certain currency, is also who owns the debt. If a foreign investor owns uh, uh, the debt in local currency, but he really has this business, the, the, the business outside the country and they operate in, uh, in a reserve currency, then th that investor has to repatriate the money to the, uh, to, to, to the uh, in, uh, in, foreign, in foreign currency. If there's an expectation of currency depreciation, that investor is going to repatriate the money. Even though they may, uh, even though local markets uh, may be very important, and as I showed before, for example, local forty percent or fifty percent of local debt is owned in some countries by foreign investors, so you're liable to get that type of mechanisms and volatility. And I mentioned two mechanisms through which uh, these financial factors 
can, uh, can, can have a detrimental effect on growth, but they may be more, but that's the thing. And, 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 and the idea of why I mentioned the financial factors is because in the past, since at least, uh, at least uh, the, the, uh, since the 2000s, uh, we haven't had, except in some countries, very high, very important current account deficits, but you do have high volatility, but you do have a lower growth. So there may be, maybe uh, 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 you can explain uh, this uh, lower trend of growth through the financial side of the of the current account. Maybe complementary to the current to the current account, but it has a known explanation. I think. Thank you. Uh, Ignacio Rocky, you want to ask a question? Please, Ignacio. Thank you very much. Well, uh, congratulations, Esteban, on such a nice uh, presentation, very informative, and uh, uh, I learned a lot uh, today from your paper. And uh, well, I have uh, three small points, actually. Uh, and this idea that Francisco pointed out regarding a, a, a competitive exchange rate uh, is held by uh, several Latin American economies, but not only Latin American economies. You know? Some uh, uh, people, such as Danny Roderick and, Oil and others, have also uh, 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 suggested that uh, uh, emerging economies and less developed economies should undertake a competitive exchange rate as a strategy for, a, 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 for faster economic growth, I mean, to, to accelerate economic growth. And in the case of uh, Latin American economies, you know, some of them are based in Brazil, uh, so these new developmentalist economies, and also in Argentina and in Mexico, there are some as well, argue that um, there is a basic problem, you know, a basic problem with exchange rate appreciation, which is which has to do with Dutch disease. And I'm afraid that the problem with exchange rate volatility nowadays has not much to do with a, with a, a Dutch disease problem. And this is not to say that there is not such a problem at all, but that is not the main problem of uh, developing economies. And I, I would argue that, and th this is something I have uh, heard uh, Tony Thurwell uh, pointing out, that if you use a competitive exchange rate to spur your economic growth rate, then you will end up uh, uh, postponing a structural change and industrial policies to improve economic growth. So actually it could be exactly the opposite. And on the other hand, I, argue that, I would argue that exchange rate appreciation is very much a consequence than a policy, an economic policy stand from a monetary authorities. So it is the result of, as Tony pointed out a while ago, a, a perhaps a, 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 a current count deficit on the one hand, or perhaps because of financial pressures from the financial markets that you pointed out. And, and that is one point. And the second point, uh, I think that what you are trying to say, or what you are saying, is that uh, what we are seeing is, um, <clears throat> some very deep changes in the international financial system have taken place, at least uh, since the early 1980s. And these deep in, uh, changes in the international, in the functioning of the uh, financial system have had a very important consequence in terms of uh, the linking growth and uh, capital flows, for instance, Prior to the 1982 financial crisis and 1982 defined crisis in Latin America, it was a more or less uh, common to see that uh, our countries would, uh, would get uh, higher levels of debt, but at the same time, at least they would get some growth. Now we have high level of debt without growth. And it seems that that has a lot to do with very deep changes in the functioning of the financial system. And the last question, well, what is the way out? I mean, we suffer from currency mismatches. And what is the way out? Do we need a 
a, 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 a reform, a deep reform of the international monetary and financial system, very similar to uh, uh, what happened back in the 1940s with Bretton Woods or what? And here, if that is the case, then we are in very bad shape. Why? Because back in the 1940s, the leading country in those times, UK, was willing to undertake a, 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 a reform of the international monetary and financial system. But nowadays, I doubt that the United States would be in a position to admit that we do need such an important reform. Thank you. Okay, well, if, uh, I'll answer. Uh, it, I'll start with that. I, I completely agree. That does not cause growth uh, in theory. And we, we had a discussion before about this. But that, through the mechanisms, can cause important contractions in the economy. So it's asymmetric. That can lead to very big vulnerabilities. And vulnerabilities when that, for example, come to the forefront when you try to expand your economy, when you have to have a giant risk perceptions and so on. So it's very asymmetric. It can cause a giant downturn, but it does not help you to increase your uh, uh, growth trend, but it can actually decrease your growth trend through the type of mechanisms. I think I, I uh, and in that sense, those are financial factors that really uh, uh, impose an important stumbling block to growth. And that's, that's the idea. It has, so if when you look at that, you have to look at how, what's the, ex, uh, the effect of that on growth, but what also is the effect of growth of that on the, on when you have a, a, a contraction, when you have a downturn in your economic cycle or what's, uh, how does, those two things relate. So for me, that is very asymmetric in that sense. Uh, the, the other thing about the, the real exchanges, I completely agree. Um, as I said before, basically income effects, if you want economic growth, you have to have structural change. And as I think it's clear from the balance of payments uh, growth literature from Thorwald's law and, and and that we agree on. I mean, the, the elasticities, income elasticity, economic growth, industrial policy. And industrial policy does not necessarily require a, uh, a manipulation of the real exchange rate, but it does require, I think, some type of government planning. Regarding Dutch disease, I'm not so sure, because if you understand the Dutch disease as a process of deindustrialization when manufacturing, let's say, loses uh, uh, part, uh, uh, share in terms of GDP or national income. Uh, I mean, most of Latin American countries that has happened and not necessarily with, uh, with exchange rate appreciations. It has happened with exchange rate depreciations. I mean, take a look, for example, uh, um, in some cases and, and in other cases, it just has happened with uh, reprimarization of commodities. So it, it has more to do with the structural change mm -hmm. uh, than anything like. Uh, when I look, for example, at the case of Colombia, when I look at the case of Chile, there are two sectors really that have gained in this, what you call this uh, financial transformation commodities, which are in some, in some sense a financial asset, and then the financial sector. Those are the two really booming sectors, at least, for example, in in Chile, and obviously the, the, the long-term growth or long-term consequences, uh, the long-term consequences on growth will be, will be felt, I mean, in the sense that uh, uh, I think uh, there will be a decline. I mean, Chile certainly has a, a downtrend uh, decline, a, a decline in the, um, in the long-term rate of growth. Regarding the financial system, yes, there's uh, been a big change in terms of financial systems. And I think we have to take this into account. And, 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 and as I said before, there are two different issues. I think that sometimes they get confused. One thing is uh, that currencies are not alike. They're not, they're not the same. And the other thing is capital mobility. And the fact that capital mobility exists, even full capital mobility, does not imply that currencies are the same. 
and that's I think is 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 very very important. You can have capital mobility, and you can have currencies that are preferred to other currencies, and that creates a lot of problems. It's not just capital mobility; it's capital mobility when you have liquidity preference for certain type of currencies over other type of currencies for historical reasons, not necessarily for purely economic reasons. As I mentioned, the US 15% of GDP, but the, the dollar is the, the, uh, the, the, the currency that has strength, that has gained uh, 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 the most important in recent years, even after the global financial crisis, during the COVID crisis and, and, and so on. I mean, even the, 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 uh, the, the swaps of the Federal Reserve aim at maintaining the, uh, the predominance of the dollar. They're not liquidity to say, there's not liquidity lines to save the world. They're liquidity lines to save the US dollar. So that's, that's very important. I think the fact that you have a, a, a financial transformation in terms of the bond market has made things more difficult. Uh, I, I think I show this in the paper that the transmission mechanisms when the international capital market um, has gained uh, preeminence over the cross-border commercial bank loans has reinforced and had, have, has made uh, transmission mechanisms even more intense. What we saw, for example, in, uh, in the first months of the pandemic, uh, those outflows for emerging market economies, when the Federal Reserve uh, you know, increased, its, uh, it, uh, increased its federal its, uh, reserve sheet, uh, you know, did all the uh, programs, uh, quantitative easing and so on, uh, uh, the uh, currencies uh, uh, flows started to go back to emerging market economies which were other investment, basically debt. Although, for example, foreign direct investment did not. Foreign direct investment de de declined, contracted in Latin America in 2020 by about 50%. So you have a, 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 a dissociation between capital flows. That's something that did not happen. And recently we have, again, the outflows uh, uh, because of the expectation of the rising yields uh, uh, of treasury bonds, the outflows from emerging market economy. So there are real problems, I think, with the uh, with the uh, with international uh, financial markets. I think things like uh, you know capital controls uh, and certain macroprudential tools are very important in the case of uh, developing developing economies. I would uh, think, for example, in the case of Argentina. Argentina received all this money from the IMF. I think it was 50 something billion dollars. Uh, a, a lot of which when uh, came went to out, 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 out of the country came and he went back to pay for, for some debt. You know, and that thing when you think about uh, 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 financial flows that come into the emerging market economies, you have to keep them in the emerging market economies so they can, you know, be put to productive uses, I said, I think. I think Harrod uh, in his uh, book on um, di economic dynamics in 1973, he said uh, that you should tie financial flows to productive uses. And uh, one of the proposals, if I recall correctly, that he made was to tax financial flows and use of financial flows to create funds for uh, the national development banks projects in developing economies. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Francisco Javier has a question. Francisco. Uh, hi, thank you for your presentation. I have only a few pair of questions. The first one is, what is the relationship, or oh, oh, excuse me, what is the relationship between currency hierarchy and the financial constraint? I am thinking in the case, of, although all the given arguments that in this seminar have, they have taken place in a, a, some kind of goal, goal long-term goal, it, it will be preferable to have a, a stable currency goal than to, uh, to, pursue, to perceive or to, uh, uh, to take an, uh, the positive, uh, that, uh, pre, uh, depreciation approach to the economy for the development of the economy. 
or we have to to have a, a major financial reform like the doc, like Dr. Pertini had, had said. Oh, because I, I agree that we have a good uh, examination of the consequence of the, of the change of the financial development, but we don't have much ideas of how to react or how to um, work uh, to how to develop economic policy to, to achieve more stable growth. And that's basically the, the question. Thank you. Uh, well, okay, so uh, the, the idea of uh, currency hierarchy, financial constraint, well, I can illustrate it. And I think I mentioned before, if you take, for example, the uh, uh, non-financial corporate sector, uh, non-financial corporate sector has been one of the sectors in emerging market economies and in Latin America that has uh, uh, that has um, registered the highest increase in debt. It's a sector that has a big currency mismatch and is a sector whose currency mismatch has grown over time. Uh, and any type of, uh, of, for example, depreciation or risk. Uh, or external risk can create important balance sheet constraints. I'm not this, the first one to say this. It's been a, a detail about, for example, the contractionary effects of a depreciation. And uh, if uh, the uh, uh, non-corporate financial sector who accounts with the, the, those firms that uh, issue bonds in the international market are the ones that are responsible are account for the lion's share of investment. And I think that happens, at least in the case of Latin America that I know. In the case of Latin America, there are a few firms that issue bonds in the international financial market that I uh, have a record of, but they account for a fair amount of investment. If those firms decide not to invest, then that will have uh, an important uh, effect on growth. And that's the way uh, the currency hierarchy creates a financial constraint and the financial constraint creates an impact in, in terms of the real economy. And that's one, I think, type of uh, mechanism. I think that we've seen at least since uh, the global financial crisis uh, that I think it, it's not only uh, due to short-term factors or it's something temporary. I think it reflects some important structural changes in the in the world economy. Relative to uh, the flows, I think the best way that you can have uh, in terms of flows is allowing countries, for example, to if you just uh, exclude the issue of financial flows and think about the current account, uh, uh, allowing countries to uh, uh, the space to have, for example, industrial policies and the instruments they need to have industrial policy so they can so they can change their productive structure, they can create structural change. That's one of the uh, one of the uh, one of the things that one needs. If you look, for example, at all the trade agreements, the trade agreements prevent that. Uh, the trade agreements many times are are um, are, uh, are are tied or come with investment agreements and those basically favor the, the foreign investor. I know that uh, for a fact that some of these investment agreements uh, uh, can sue the, 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 have clauses where the foreign investor can sue uh, or bring to court the government of another country because they are, um, yeah, they are trying to implement expropriation policies uh, expropriation, they're doing some policies or policies that are tantamount to expropriation, which means, for example, controls, which means income taxes, uh, tax tax income, and the, and the like. Those things, I think, have really been detrimental to developing economies in terms of uh, financial uh, uh, policies that can be used. I think the recent policy by the recent call of uh, Janet Yellen to increase, for example, SDRs, 
are is a welcome initiative because the special drawing rights are automatic. They, they are a loan that does not come with a repayment. When you use special drawing rights, you pay a very small rate of interest, which is very useful for those countries that have a, a very high risk premium. And uh, the SDRs, although they're a central bank reserve asset and they increase reserves, and therefore they avoid uh, the, 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 uh, the cost of increasing reserves, as we all know, increasing reserves is costly. And this is uh, the counter cyclical monetary policy par excellence of uh, developing countries is increasing reserves. Besides increasing reserves, SDRs can be used for development purposes. And that's one way I think when you can reform uh, the financial system, you know, not the only way, the only one obviously, but one of the, one of the things one can think uh, to provide greater space to policy con to developing countries to uh, carry out their development um, their uh, development policies and strategies i think that the tragedy is that developing countries have smaller have really small and smaller and smaller uh, policy spaces to uh, to uh, for for growth and for social and uh, and economic development and that we will see that uh, after during the pandemic, a lot of countries increase their debt, and most of the countries eventually are thinking about a, uh, a, uh, a fiscal consolidation, which means basically austerity uh, policies. I think that uh, those are the uh, what I would. There are other obviously alternatives, but that's what I would think. Obviously, a reallocation of a special drawing rights from developed countries to developing countries is also an alternative with the adequate uh, conditions, I think. But that's, those are some of the, uh, the measures I think that are worth thinking about and that uh, can maybe receive some kind of support from uh, the international uh, community. In, in terms of the IMF, what I would say is the IMF, for example, during the pandemic, they, the IMF implemented a series of emergency lines most of that, it's about $105 billion to developing economies. 66 of those $105 billion, it went to Latin America. But when you look at the financing needs of most of the countries of Latin America, these cover about 33, between 25 and 33% of uh, financing needs of Latin America, which forces countries either to go to the international capital markets uh, multilateral development banks that do not lend concessionally to middle-income countries, or uh, simply an IMF, uh, you know, conditional conditionality type of program. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, okay. Uh, we are going very near to end the seminar. So one more question if you someone want to ask or someone okay uh, Aida, yeah. please hi uh, so just probably uh, two questions very quickly so in the light of the, of the pandemic uh, how did you see the recovery because it seems to me like uh, the financial factors are uh, quite relevant in this case. So uh, we are gonna have problems in investment because of uh, depreciation and uh, I mean, all, all the situations. So um, how uh, do you see uh, the post COVID and the recovery of the Latin American countries? Uh, one thing, and the second you mentioned about uh, the macro financial policies and whether they can play a role uh, not just for the recovery, but for a later uh, crisis. And in what are you thinking of? Uh, I mean, uh, just uh, capital controls or tax in, in external uh, capital or what else are you thinking of? And uh, in that, uh, whether you think it's relevant that not just developing countries implement uh, macro policies, but also uh, advanced economies because of the global spillovers across countries. So those would be, thank you. 
Uh, okay, uh, regarding the the uh, the recovery, I mean, this is a story. I mean, if you look, if you look, for example, at the IMF uh, data, uh, the World Economic Outlook for October 2020, and the update of the World Economic Outlook for 2000 January 2021. They, in April, they will again uh, uh, review their estimates. But so far, this is a story. When you look at all the regions, all the developing regions, Latin America is the worst impact. And uh, even though the initial predictions were about not minus 9% in terms of contraction of, of regional GDP, and now they are about 7.7 .7 according to ECLAC or 6 point something according to the IMF, it's worse than any other developing region. And that's a problem. And investment contracted in Latin America, according to the estimates I have, by minus 20% in real terms. It's huge. It's huge. And it's going to be very hard. And when you contract investment, it means, from my point of view, destruction of capacity. Uh, also, uh, everything has to do with product, uh, productivity, be affected. I, and we know from looking at, the, uh, at cycles that investment tends to contract much more than GDP. In the downturn, it's asymmetric once again, but in the upward phase, uh, it, 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 uh, the ratio of investment to GDP falls during the, uh, during the, uh, the contraction and it, tends, it, ten it doesn't fall as much, it doesn't increase as much during the expansion. So investment relative to GDP, not investment relative to itself, but relative to GDP does not gain what it loses in the, in the downturn. So there's going to have to be a very important effort in terms of investment. Governments have made uh, an important, important efforts in terms of fiscal expenditure, but the bulk, 70% of government expenditures are transfers. Basically, not investment. And so governments are going to have to invest eventually or help to bring in private sector investment. Something is going to have to be done. And you will see increases in the rate of growth. And some, in some cases, uh, 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 very high increases in rates of growth because you start from a situation where you have a lockdown, there's no activity to a situation where there is some activity. So, but in terms of GDP per capita, or in terms of GDP levels, the estimate so far as things stand, and this is a purely statistical estimate, is that countries are going to regain their love GDP levels of, let's say before the pandemic in about five years or 10 years. So you're going to be have a lost decade. In terms of investment, uh, if uh, the minus 20% means destruction of capacity and of productive structure, it means that you can't think about counter-cyclical policies in the same way in the pre-pandemic and in the post-pandemic. Because the response of supply factors are going to be different. If there's destruction in capacity, uh, uh, damages in productive structures, and the and the and, and the and the like, so the recovery is going to be difficult and it's going to be very long. In, uh, and if you add to that, and I don't want to be pessimistic, but if you add to that the fact that the vaccination is proceeding at a very uneven pace in Latin America and Chile, so. I think it's going well, but in some other cases, uh, in Brazil, I think things are quite bad. Uh, uh, the the region is going to be in a in a difficult difficult situation. I mean, the the effect was huge. Uh, the the estimates by ECLA points to a closure of 2.7 billion firms, increases in poverty, informality, all of that. Part of the reason why the uh, uh, the pandemic uh, had such big effects on uh, Latin America is the poor productive structure, the, the feeble productive right. structure, and the fact that the, the, the pandemic found Latin America growing at very low rates of interest. 
if you, uh, I mean, low rates of growth, if you uh, add on top of that, that the productive structure was really feeble and not very, uh, not very high productivity and so on, and not very diversified and so on, uh, with a lot of informality, then, uh, then there, there are the effects. And, and the, 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 the question is how far can governments uh, uh, become indebted to, uh, to, to try to uh, boost demand and how far can governments, uh, uh, let's say, crowd in private sector investment that do not see an increase in on demand so far. So th those are the things one has to take into account. If you take in the case of Chile, for example, because the, the government, although they spent a lot on transfer, it was insufficient, then a lot, a fair amount of people took out their, their, their pension savings. They, their, they took out their pension savings twice, and they're thinking about taking another, another third tranche of their payment savings uh, in order to, to, to survive in order to buy things that they need, in order to buy food, uh, to, to maintain their, their standard of living and so on. So I would think that in some cases, although there are these transfer, I mean, it was clearly very insufficient and governments are still worried about not only their debt levels, but about payment, yeah, their, their external debt service. The, the same data that I showed, that I uh, mentioned regarding the IMF, if you look at the IMF, World Economic Outlook for October 22, you'll see that Latin America, in terms of, if you take the, the ratio of external debt to expo, uh, exports of goods and services, has the highest debt ratio. It's about 57%. So 57% of the income of exports of goods and services go to debt payments, not to pay for imports or capital goods, debt payments. That's huge. Uh, so the recovery, I don't know yet. Some countries will be growing, but what they gain in terms of employment, in terms of uh, GDP levels, in terms of what the situation was before, it's going to be difficult. I think things like these, this, these crises, they, they change. Uh, they change the, the, they change and they may provoke uh, a regressive structural change in some cases. Regarding macroprudential, macroprudential is necessary. And I think in the macroprudential is generally it refers to systemic risk, uh, if I didn't mention before. And in, in generally in, the, in developing uh, developed countries, it refers uh, a lot to the domestic financial sector. I think in Latin America, we should think about macroprudential policies in terms of the vulnerabilities of the external sector. And I think things like capital controls, uh, pools for exchange rate intervention, adequate liquidity are very, very, uh, uh, are very important. The thing with uh, the, the one of the favorite tools that uh, developing uh, Latin American countries and some developing economies have used uh, in terms of macroprudential are exchange rate interventions. I'm not so sure that they work very much and they are fairly costly once again. So we have to think about some type of macroprudential policies that are not costly and that uh, uh, maintain, uh, maintain stability. Uh, I remember, and I want to end up with, uh, with uh, a quote from Prebish, Raul Prebish. In 1945, Raul Prebish, when he was working with Robert Triffin um, regarding the reform of central banks in Latin America and how central banks should be at the, at the service of development. That's what Robert Triffin used to say when he did all these mission, these missions to Latin America with very different than the camera missions. He said, my, 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 my missions were revolutionary. We're putting the central banks at the service of development. Uh, Prebish uh, wrote once, uh, this is in 1945, at a meeting of uh, central, bank, um, central bank officials of Latin America. He said uh, the, the, the center Country, the center countries and center, the center, he was referring to the United States, can just expand its monetary policies. And the center is, does not need to be uh, concerned about uh, uh, exchange rate parities. And he says, this is not uh, the case in, peri in, in the periphery. In the periphery, you have to, we have to be worried about exchange rate parities. We have to be worried about reserves. 
And he says, this is why I, uh, I support controls, exchange rate controls. And he says, it's not like I like controls. He says, I abominate controls, but we have no other remedy. So in terms of the periphery, where you do not issue a reserve currency, where you have all these restrictions, including what the, re the restrictions imposed by trade, uh, by commercial policies, which was the last, let's say, policy space left for uh, developing countries, one has to think about how can one regain policy space. And I think that was very important to, to Keynes, I think, when he did the currency union, uh, uh, this idea that, that you know, capital controls is something not only uh, was it important for speculation, but the real uh, reason was to provide freedom for the movement of exchange rate, to have the autonomy to move the, ex the I mean, the rate of interest, I'm sorry. And, uh, and uh, developing economies must try to gain, uh, to have the tools, macroprudential tools to have some policy autonomy. That, that, that would be my, my answer to, to, that, uh, to, to, to that question. We have a lot of global spillovers. We are from the financial cycle, from the trade cycle, when, for example, uh, 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 Prebish, uh, uh, you know, he had this a national monetary policy where he uh, imposed expansionary aggregate demand with exchange rate control was pre precisely through exchange rate controls, which was a way to, uh, which was a, uh, a, uh, a way to, uh, to, uh, to control imports basically through, through, uh, um, um, through, through exchange rate uh, uh, licenses. Uh, the idea was to isolate the economy from the fluctuations of the external uh, of of, uh, of, uh, of the external sector, and I think we have to look for some way to also isolate uh, the fluctuations of the external uh, cycle, whether it's through uh, more stable liquidity, whether it's through some type of uh, controls. Uh, that we can think about. That's what my answer for now. Thank you, Esteban. We are going short of time. Uh, we are thank you for your participation in the seminar and the presentation and the presence of Tony Trio too. And the, if Ignacio or Benjamin want to make some few words to end this session, please. Yes. Yes, very short because we are running out of time now. So I just want to thank uh, uh, Esteban once again for such a wonderful presentation. And I think it was a great contribution to our seminar, to our Tony Thelward seminar on development economics. And of course, I also want to thank Tony and Penny for staying around this late in England and also Aida who is also in, in, in England. So thank you very much for joining us. And uh, of course, uh, I also thank all of the uh, participants in, in the seminar. I think uh, uh, we, we will keep it up. And uh, I, I mean, you, you, your participation simply uh, stimulates us to, to keep on. Okay, thank you very much. And I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you for the, the invitation, Ignacio. Thank uh, to the University Autonoma. Thank you very much, uh, really, to Tony Thorwell that stayed during my presentation. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much for your questions. And as I said before, thank you very much for your uh, co contribution to economics that has really certainly influenced uh, very much the way I looked at developing economies and at economics in general. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye now. Bye, Thank Tony. Bye, Penny. Uh, it's Bye. one o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I'm, looking, I'm looking forward to see you again. Thank you. Yes, sure. Yeah. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Bye.